Okay, beautiful. So, Alrighty. could you please just introduce yourself for everybody? And, you know, as we were talking about, maybe share a little bit about your particular attire of today and why that's right. important. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, George. Uh, Yossi, my uh, Tuvaluan brother, it's an absolute mm. pleasure and honor and a privilege to be here uh, on the, the show today. And, um, yeah, so, as I said before the show, I apologize for my appearance. Um, I'm actually in hospital at the moment, <laughs> um, uh, ready to undergo surgery, but you know how we are in the Pacific. Uh, we're resilient. Um, whatever the circumstances, uh, our, our duty to uh, our people and our duty to disseminate uh, information uh, does, not, does not end with... Uh, minor personal hiccups like that. Uh, the reason for the attire is I've got some fairly uh, significant uh, medical uh, cream on my back that makes it uh, all over my back, uh, makes it rather uncomfortable and pretty impractical to, mm. to have a shirt on. So, uh, but no harm, no foul. I'm in our, our traditional uh, Polynesian uh, Pacific attire. Yep. Um, yeah, so with respect to the ink, um, just a bit of history. Uh, it's, it is well known that uh, Samoa still has uh, what they call the pea uh, for males and the maru for the females, uh, which is the traditional tattoo uh, of uh, numerous things uh, to show your, your chiefly status or your allegiance to a, a clan, a family in a village, or as a sign of reaching uh, adulthood. And that goes from the stomach, uh, above the waist and mid-back, down to below the knees. Uh, in Tonga, we had exactly the same uh, tattoo called uh, a Tāvaka. I will send you um, a a sketch done by one of uh, Captain James Cook's uh, uh, staff or crew, rather, mm. uh, who visited Tonga in the 1770s mm. and was able to record uh, the very similar uh, Tongan Tabaka, which uh, has more uh, solid black and uh, but has very distinctive uh, Tongan motifs on it. Uh, on my uh, my particular ink, I'm, the reason ours uh, died out was that in 1839, when our our first king, in what is considered uh, modern time, uh, the current dynasty is is of course uh, directly uh, descended from our very first uh, Tukitonga uh, nearly 2,000 years ago. Uh, but the current uh, iteration began with uh, Tupo the First, His Majesty King Tafao Tupo the First, and who Christianized Tonga and mm. who uh, took on, uh, mm. a, adopted a codified uh, Westminster constitutional monarchy system like the UK and codified our traditions into. Uh, Western laws. So because it was heavily influenced by the missionaries, uh, one of their great, uh, not great, <laughs> uh, one of their uh, most uh, important initiatives for them was to stamp out any of our ancient, what they considered uh, pagan rituals, mm. Yeah. and pagan aspects of our culture. Uh, and one of those was tattooing. So yeah. in the very first Tongan Code of Laws, known as the Vavatu Code of 1839, uh, tattooing, either bearing a tattoo or being a tufunga who gave tattoos, became illegal and carried a 10-year prison sentence or a rather steep... Uh, fine of 
then shillings and pounds sterling. So, mm. yeah, I am part mm. of uh, an, an attempt to, uh, yeah, bring about a renaissance of our, our tradition. We have a, a number of uh, tufungas who have gone back and apprenticed under the Samoan, uh, the most well-respected Samoan tufungas, the uh, mm. uh, Suluapes, who I'm mm. sure you have heard of. Uh, we have uh, a, mm. a Suluape uh, Toitu is our first and most prolific uh, one. And I'm awaiting to get uh, my Tongan, Tavaka, the Tongan version of the Samoan Pea, mm. uh, from him. But wow. the current one that I wear is uh, my title mm. uh, from where I, I get my hereditary estate uh, is the northernmost island in Tonga. It's actually closer to Samoa. Mm. If you turn on your AM radio, you'll get uh, a pia, but you won't get no offer. <laughs> it's that far away from, from Tonga Tapu. Wow. Uh, it's called the Island of Nua for All. And uh, it was initially settled by Marquesans oh. before it became part of Tonga. Hmm. Yeah. So half of, of my uh, torso is tattooed with uh, the markings of the clan to which I belong. The current dynasty of kings are called the Tukikana uh, They are the kings with the connection to Upolu. So the very first king of this dynasty married a maiden Taupo who was brought from Samoa because uh, it was the practice back then to bring brides from Samoa. It was uh, during the, 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 the final stages of Tongan Empire when we still uh, uh, had Fiji for our ironwood because Tonga is, is resource poor and we needed their ironwood for our, our war canoes, mm -hmm. our thousand man strong war canoes. And we needed our crops from Samoa because their, their soil is much more fertile. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike uh, us who are uh, a sort of limestone uh, coral atoll, they have uh, more, more volcanic islands with therefore more fruit fertile soil and better crops. And uh, arguably back then, still now a debate, uh, prettier girls. So <laughs> the royal wives <laughs> were always brought from there. Yep. So uh, that's uh, the very first Fusitua or Lord Fusitua was a grandson of Ngata. Um, the first Tuiganukupolu. Uh, the previous dynasty of the Tuihata Kalawa had, uh, had a noble, a lord in Niwa For'olu who had uh, laid claim to the island and sent message to Tonga that he no longer recognised central rule from Tonga and the Tuiganukupolu, and he declared himself the Tui Niwa, the king of Niwa and would cede from, uh, from Katoa. Uh, Ngata, the first Tuikanakulu, therefore sent his grandson, whose name was uh, Kaufustua Weikatao. Uh, Weikatao means um, uh, almost, uh, it, literally, it means the war trigger. Uh, it describes a young man who if ever so slightly uh, riled, would go to war. That was his nature, and that's why he was sent to quell the rebellion. Mm. Uh, he did so and ended up staying there and being given an estate there. But because he's originally from uh, Tongatapu, uh, I therefore am part of the Tukganukupolu clan, and that half of my body carries... Um, the markings of the uh, Hangata Motua, or the clan of the old snake, which mm. is, is uh, the Tukalaku Bolu's clan. Um, uh, a great uh, um, side story is that uh, the two Matais that accompanied the Samoan maiden uh, 
uh, one was fully vai and one was Akawola, and they became estate holders in Tonga um, and uh, were given estates. So Lord Fulivai was um, uh, oh, so, uh, that's all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Uh, so uh, Lord Fulivai, who uh, accompanied her, my mother is a descendant of that Lord Fulivai. Her grandfather uh, was the previous Lord Fulivai. And she's, they are from a village called um, Alipata in Samoa. So when I first travelled to Samoa to stay with uh, my big sister, or who is uh, both family and friend, uh, Honourable Fiamé, who you may uh, have heard is the Prime Minister-elect for Samoa, uh, she took me to the village of Alipata and I was able to get what the Samoans call a kaulima. Uh, from the village of Alibata. Uh, the other half, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time with this story. No, the this other is half, why we're talking, my brother. <laughs> yeah, the other half is um, I went and researched and ended up having to go to the Centre for Pacific Studies in Canberra at the university, at the Australian National University which has the largest uh, archive of uh, Pacific artefacts uh, in the world. And they found um, manuscripts which bore the markings of the original Marquesan descendants of my estate. And therefore the other half of my torso uh, has those Marquesan uh, designs which uh, predate uh, the Tongan occupation and because we intermarried, uh, the, the, the Fuskua title arrived there and married into the, the descendants of the Marquesans. So I'm descended both uh, from the original title holder of my title and from the uh, Marquesans' descendants from that island. So, yeah, that's the story. <laughs> <laughs> Of the outfit, but I hope it didn't drag on too long. No, no, no. This is very important because I think for a lot of our listeners or watchers, you know, it's it's what you just described is not something that uh, a lot of people today understand or maybe have even forgotten. You know, uh, the the importance of um, you know of, of culture, of lineage, of kinship, of clan systems, um, and right. I, yeah, I, I'm glad that you shared that because. Like I'm, I'm familiar, you know, luckily because of my, my mother growing up, you know, explaining all these things. And I know even my relatives, I, I was always amazed at how like my aunties, uncles, grandparents, you know, how they remembered so right. many of the family lines, right? And how everybody is connected right. with each other. But these days, you know, especially the current and like next generations, like they've forgotten a lot of that. Yes, yes. That's, that's one of the issues, which is especially for... Um, what are considered traditional leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be very careful to ensure that there is a, a handing down of the institutional traditional knowledge that certain generations have, because if that is not done, then as soon as they pass, that yeah. entire uh, uh, body of cultural knowledge, of historical knowledge, uh, is lost because uh, we were, of, uh, we are, of course, all the products of an oral tradition in exactly. in the Pacific in general and in Polynesia in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, our oral traditions uh, are the the markers of our history. They carry the stories from creation uh, yeah. and yeah. and onwards, the very creation of our, our peoples. So. Uh, and one of the funny things, um, for instance, not funny, but uh, quite poignant to watch is uh, the oral traditions that have been handed down from generation to generation tell of changes in, uh, in the surroundings, in the weather, uh, in uh, the kinds of uh, natural disasters that occurred, and you can almost map to the to the day 
uh, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when those carbon emissions began to get out of hand, because our oral traditions tell of a, an increase in natural disasters mm -hmm. and an increase, uh, a, a movement closer and closer towards the, sh uh, towards the shore uh, of the, the coastline yep. and of, uh, of them witnessing uh, after a generation or two that the level of the sea had risen uh, comparable to where it was previously. So we have uh, cultural, traditional, oral history markers mm. of uh, what they now would call meteorological data. Mm. So, yeah, the significance of those oral histories uh, cannot be uh, yeah. cannot be emphasised enough, brother. Exactly. I mean, it's fascinating because, uh, well, again, uh, for, for, for those uh, who, who are listening or watching, um, you know, for how we met, right, you know, we met uh, through Twitter. Was it Twitter or Clubhouse first? That's right. Yeah, to, Twitter. Twitter, 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 correct. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one thing I appreciated uh, about you was that, you know, you were talking about a lot of these like cultural things within groups, right, online um, that right. have no idea um, uh, about these interplays. Um, so, you know, you are obviously um, involved at a, at a government political level, right? Um, you are uh, representing uh, Tonga, but you are, you're currently in New Zealand, is that correct? I'm currently in New Zealand because of the, the border shutdown. Yep. Uh, the only people that were, are being re repatriated at the moment are our, uh, our mobility, labour mobility program workers mm. who do fruit picking in Australia and New Zealand. Mm. The flights are organised on their behalves and only a few seats may be available on some of those flights for extra passengers. So people who it, it sort of, yeah, it goes by um, priority. So people who've been away from Tonga longest get first choice at the seats and so on and so on until uh, those who uh, left Tonga last uh, will obviously be re repatriated last. Yep. So it's, a, it's, yeah, it's a matter of um, just waiting your turn because uh, it, is the, it is the reason that Tonga is one of the half a dozen countries. Uh, I think with Tuvalu and uh, Nauru also, who are still completely COVID free and have never had uh, any COVID precisely because of our very responsible border closures. So yeah, mm. I have no issues with uh, the slight uh, inconvenience <laughs> of not being able to get home uh, and back to work as soon as I'd like, mm. if it means ensuring the safety of our country so small price to pay exactly yeah. exactly and you know for you uh, i think what might be useful for people um is you know maybe explaining right the title so i believe your title um you received that from was it your father um previously uh, that's right so our, our titles in tonga mm -hmm. when we uh became a Westminster style constitutional monarchy, mm. we codified and turned, uh, we codified our ancient uh, traditional system of uh, chiefhood uh, into a Westminster um, constitutional monarchical system, which at the time still had feudal laws. So, whereas previously you would have a number of eligible uh, claimants to a title. That's that's the uh, the tradition in both Melanesia and Polynesia, and still practiced in Fiji and Samoa. Mm -hmm. So in Samoa, you'll have a number of candidates, and the one who is most capable, or who is able to provide best to the village, or who is the greatest mm -hmm. warrior, becomes the the one who gets the title. Because we uh, we took on a particular uh, form of land title succession. You need predictability of, of inheritance for that. So Tonga then took on both for the, the monarch, the royal family, the nobility, and the entire country, uh, what's called primogeniture. Father to son, father to son, father to son, uh, inheritance, succession of title. So for the general population, 
they receive uh, free land from the state. Uh, every male who reaches the age of capacity at the age of 16 gets a free uh, quarter acre of land in an urban or village area to live and eight free acres uh, in a rural area to farm. And that, that succession is done father to son, father to son. So the, uh, then you go the next step up and to the nobles or the lords, they have the same thing, but theirs also includes a title and a hereditary estate. So it's father to son, father to son. Uh, but the distinction needs to be made that whereas the British system, when you say feudal lords, it, it implies the British system of a feudal lord who is like a landlord on his estate and the people that live there are tenants who have to pay him leases and pay him uh, the, for the right to farm and then pay him taxes. Because we're Polynesian cultures, uh, the, the title holder is considered a custodian of the land and of the people, not a landlord to, yeah, to lord it over them. Uh, you're, you're responsible for the people also. So in a modern sense, um, the title holder would be expected to ensure that the people on your land get access to basic services, electricity, water, get good access to education, healthcare, access to justice. That's your job as the title holder mm. to if um, where the state uh, fall, falls short, you fill in the gaps. So mm. if there's a funeral uh, in the village uh, and they have no money, they don't go to their MP. They will come to their, their chief and say, oh, we need $5,000 uh, for the funeral or for the wedding. And it's very common when, uh, when growing up. I remember many times going to my parents, oh, I need money for this and this. And they say, sorry, uh, uh, the people in the village need this and that mm -hmm. comes before, before you do. So wow. your, your duty or your responsibility to your, your clan come before your personal, uh, uh, your personal nuclear family needs. The duty always comes first. Wow. What do you, how, how do you think this, uh, what lessons do you think this provides for, you know, today's uh, Western world, right? Because it, it seems like you guys, you know, uh, one of the, the few constitutional monarchies that uh, still exist, especially in the Pacific, right? You know, like right. what about it do you think makes it work, you know, and, and why it's still around and, and what sort of lessons are there for, for others? Yeah, I think one of the main reasons it's still around is that it's, at, at heart, it's based upon reciprocity. Uh, it's meant to be, and uh, the example I just gave is a great example of it. It doesn't work if it's just a lord who expects one-way traffic of tribute and tax and lease from his people, then it's going to collapse. It only works if it's two ways, and it's a people who feel uh, their, their duty to, uh, to uh, show gratitude for the free land that they get from their Lord. Because remember, uh, it's not like the UK where the tenants paid for the land. By law, we have to give uh, the land away. So every male in my village that comes to me at 16 and says, I want my free land, by law, it's my job to find him free land to give to him from my estate. Mm. So... I think that reciprocity, uh, not just for that relationship, but Tongan culture in general, mm. uh, it's, it's, it may seem to some a stratified uh, system, but it's a system that's based on reciprocity. So um, the father is the head of the household, but men hold power, women hold rank. So mm. women are, in Tonga mm. hold social rank superior to men. Hmm. Men hold the administrative day-to-day -day authority, but women hold ranks. So your father's sister is the social superior of all his children. Hmm. So at, at mine or my sister's wedding, birthday, funerals in our family, all the tributes are taken and given to our father's sister as hmm. tribute to her social rank. Hmm. Uh, so uh, 
that's that's the reciprocity. And then uh, when you move that out in concentric circles, then a group of nuclear families uh, become an extended family, which have uh, what we call a ulumotua, or an elder as the leader. Yep. Then those various extended families come together as a village who have a noble lord as its head. Yep. And those number of villages come together as clans or regions with uh, the, the noble who is the head of that clan of nobles at the head. And then those clans all come together under uh, the king who is the father of the nation. So our, our system of government uh, is patterned on our social structure because it, makes, it would make no sense uh, to have your system of government the way you are governed mm -hmm. every day have no uh, relationship or have no direct tie mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. the way that you live your life every day. Uh, mm -hmm. So if your, if your society is, is built a certain way, then uh, if you want to ensure uh, harmonious uh, existence and development of your society, then your system of government... Um, needs to reflect that society. So uh, a society that lives uh, communist as China, mm -hmm. it would make, make no sense to have a, a Western liberal democratic government at its head because mm -hmm. there would be a complete, yeah, a conflict because the two don't melt. Exactly. Yeah. So like mm -hmm. Tuvalu, like everywhere else, in the, mm -hmm. our governments have our mm -hmm. cultures baked into them. Uh, mm -hmm very deliberately and by necessity. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes you think, right, about like um, often uh, from a Western point of view, you know, there's always about, there's always a sort of push or support for, you know, democracy everywhere. But I mean, we even know, having seen what happened in 2020 with, with Trump, et cetera, um, you know, a, a democracy can also lead to demagoguery, right? Like with an uneducated populace, right? right democracy has its flaws right. as well. Um, and also, you know, when you yeah. try to place a democracy in the Middle East or something, there are cultural conflicts um, exactly. that come with it. And particularly the, the, the legacy of colonization, mm. when, you put, when you impose that upon a populace who may not even be uh, ethnically or religiously homogenous, they're all different kinds of people that got squashed together by a colonizer who actually don't have anything to do with each other. Exactly. Uh, you must be sensitive to those cultural groups and let them give them their space and their, breath their breathing space uh, and their political and social space also. Mm, exactly. Oh, lost your audio. Sorry, bro. Yeah, 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 no, I'm there. I was just telling the, uh, ah. the nurse physio. <laughs> so, yeah. No worries. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, no, no, you, you were in the middle of saying something. Yeah, so um, when uh, it's, uh, the Middle East is a great mm. example, uh, closer to home, mm. uh, Papua New Guinea is a mm. perfect example. Mm. The, the, what's happening in West Papua mm. and the Indonesian... Uh, uh, yeah, basically military assault, almost genocidal yes. on the West Papua people mm -hmm. is precisely a, 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 a result of a colonial legacy of mm -hmm. pushing two groups of people together that have nothing in common and forcing them to call themselves a country. Mm -hmm. And that results in... Uh, either tribal or inter-provincial inter or inter-regional or here international warfare, where in the, in Indonesia is imposing itself on a, a, a piece of land which is part of, of Papua New Guinea. It's not part of Indonesia. Mm. Oh, man, land conflict, right? Um, and it's... Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's, that's one of the things that... Um, uh, the guys in your field are mm. able to solve by putting, um, delineating our traditional boundaries mm. and going back to those traditional boundaries. And once they're mm. observed correctly, 
mm. and you put them on the public ledger, then they they are there transparently and they are there to stay because um, yeah you can't you cannot change mess with them yeah. without uh, everyone else in the country knowing uh, what shenanigans you may be up to yeah exactly and what yeah what are your thoughts on you know property rights like so it's interesting right we look you know the older I get the more I look into our 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 histories you know and and, and uh, we spoke right. about how, like Tuvalu, and and actually specifically Nanumea, from where my grandmother is from. Nanumea has right. more of the Tongan influence um, as opposed to the Samoan influence, uh, because Tuvalu right. is you know got a mixture of the the Tuvaluan and Samoan uh, bloodlines. And right. um, you know, back during the warring periods, right, land was really whoever could forcefully take it. <laughs> you know, right. um, that's yeah. that's that's what you got. Um, but these Absolutely. days. One thing that we can probably um, be grateful for, at least from a, a Western standpoint, right, is like, you know, the concept of property rights and things. Um, but how do you think that will play out um, with things like, you know, blockchain tech in the future, right? You know, what do you see right. as the, the, the pros and cons around this? Uh, I, I don't see too many cons. I see a lot of pros mm. because... Um, they can have our traditional uh, values mm. and our traditional... So take um, uh, a land registry, for instance. Yep. We can have uh, our system of, mm. of uh, succession mm. and of land title, mm. uh, but that has to be decided beforehand because once you put it on, on the public ledger, mm. then you don't want to... Uh, uh, mess around with it too much uh, yeah. because, yeah, it causes a, a lot of unnecessary issues. Mm. So once you have a uh, consultation with the public mm. and they agree on a particular form of land succession and land registry, mm. uh, such as we have in Tonga, yep. uh, and you, you have that very well defined on paper, then once you take that from paper and put that on the blockchain, mm. uh, then it becomes extremely transparent and much, much e more easy uh, uh, to govern because mm. you can check a piece of land. Mm. Uh, in Tonga, it's illegal mm. to sell land mm. or to buy yeah. land, mm. but you can lease land. Yep. So if land is to be leased, uh, you can go into the public ledger and immediately within seconds get the entire title history of that piece of land from the, from the ledger rather than having to go through uh, archive after archive after archive of hard copies, uh, which, and hard copies, remember, are tantamount to uh, tampering. So yeah. if you've got a member in the Ministry of Lands, you've got a staff member yeah. who's um, sympathetic to your cause over uh, the competing person's cause for the same piece of land, mm. all he has to do is a few pencil or pen entries mm. on on the uh, the old deed yep. and uh, the land can end up going mm. somewhere it shouldn't and then going there pretty much forever because with the Tongan system of succession, once you've got that land, it's in your family forever until mm. you reach a generation where they have no male heirs whatsoever. Mm. And then it will go back to the estate holder. Mm. But yeah, that's, that's a perfect use. Um, the, having the entire hand side mm. of the legislature on a public ledger so that uh, it, the, the laws that we pass uh, make sense to people because they can immediately uh, at the touch of a key get the debates that were behind passing or not passing that legislature and can reach the meaning. Uh, why was it passed? What were the, the policy concerns? Because if this means that I have to pay an extra couple of dollars for a loaf of bread or uh, it's going to cost my children a little bit more to go to school or it's going to cost my children a little bit more to get get healthcare, I want to know why, what are the policy decisions that were behind that increase and are they, if they're in uh, aid of the country in general, uh, because uh, those uh, VAT or GST taxes 
go to the government to help build hospitals and help build schools, then all right, I'll, I'll, I'll cop that for you extra dollars. But I have a right as a citizen to have access to that information. And when you've got your legislature, uh, all your legislature, all your legislation mm. and all the hand side or the uh, record of debates and of the parliamentary standing committees. Uh, so all these things I've listed are the things that uh, my main uh, purview of, of, of my job, what I do, uh, yeah, only good can come of having them. But again, you have to make sure that the paper version you're putting on the, on the ledger has to be uh, as untainted as possible before it goes on. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because there is this sort of transition period to, you know, um, even outside of blockchain technology, right. Of just digitization of all these other manual records, That's right. right. Paper That's records. Right. Um, and, and I've heard this, you know, from, you know, organizations like United Nations to, to others, uh, they're more concerned about like, how do we ensure that the integrity of the data that is being recorded is good, you know, to begin with. That's right. Otherwise, yeah. you know, you're putting something on the blockchain, which is incorrect to begin with. And now you got something that's, that's there forever, right. which, um, yeah, it doesn't help either. Uh, yeah, so that's, I was, yeah. Um, I was, I spoke to a guy who was um, a refugee. He's from Liberia mm. and he's in his late 20s, early 30s now. Mm. And he had walked from Liberia across Northern Africa. Wow. and made his way across Europe and finally to the United States mm. uh, as a refugee, and he received asylum there. Mm. And that was the early 2000s, he and his, his mother. Mm. And now, 20 years later, his mother's ill and her dying, she has not passed away, mm. her dying wish is to go back to uh, Liberia mm. and to claim their land back. And he was promised by the representatives of the Cardano team in, uh, in Liberia mm. that their blockchain implementation mm. uh, would promise that she would get her land back. Mm. But if your blockchain team mm. is uh, in cahoots with... Uh, a corrupt minister and ministry of lands from the outset, then you're making promises to yeah. people whose hope you really shouldn't be playing with. That's, that's almost cosmically and karmically unforgivable mm. for you to yes. play with uh, someone who's had that much of a hard life to play with their hope. And then uh, mm. your blockchain technology is as good as it is. It's no use if uh, you're going in with the priorities of a corrupt minister uh, mm. who the team has uh, been willing to turn a blind eye to to get their their blockchain solution up and running. So, yeah, I, I know what you, what you mean. You know, and this is uh, one of the things that's really interesting, right? Because if you look at uh, blockchain technology, and of course, right now we're in an uh, era where uh, there's a lot of competing, you know, projects, right? Right. And, a lot of uh, false promises or empty promises that are being made exactly. just to get people on. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's integrity because it's so fascinating, right? Like blockchain, if you just look at what a blockchain is, it's really about being a, a, a truth machine, right? Like it will hold right. whatever you put onto it. And exactly. Into it. Exactly. If you put the, whatever you put into it, it will hold yes. and it will hold um, with uh, ethics and integrity. But if what you're putting onto it does isn't baked in with ethics and integrity from the outset, mm. then it's only as good as the content you give it. Correct. Correct. And you know, as we know, right? You know, light and dark, it's always there. You can never completely get rid of one or the other. That's right. That's right. Um, as much as we'd hope uh, that we exactly. can. Exactly. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we haven't reached that perfect world yet. Uh, that level of consciousness, right? Um, from us human oh, beings. Yeah, very much, brother. Very much. I think one of the most interesting things in terms of behavior that I've seen is that 
you have a lot of people who are worried, you know, about blockchain and Bitcoin and all these things because they're like, right. oh my God, is this really just a, a big brother now? You know, a, a way to right. just right. record everything and monitor it. Um, and th th there's a lot of people who think that that's a bad thing. Um, what are right. your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? You know, because I'm sure you've heard this before. Um, yeah, what are yes. your thoughts on that? Um, I I had the privilege i consider it a privilege because it was a great experience mm. to be in china as one half of our honorary consulate uh, team before we uh, had a full embassy in china mm. so i lived in beijing for two years mm. uh, as an honorary consul and i was able to see um, the level at which they advance with technology yeah. And uh, the way in which uh, central control has issues, particularly for uh, Western uh, liberal democracies, such as in Europe and the United States. Uh, but they also have strengths in, in that the reason China is able to achieve in 30 years, the past mm -hmm. three decades, what it took Europe and America nearly 200 years to do mm. is because um, the society buys into it. The, yes. the government says, all right, here's our plan, and yeah. everybody buys in, and we're all going to do it this way, and they achieve the goal. They yeah. got the economic advancement that they're at today in, yeah, in three decades, what yep. took nearly two yep. centuries for the rest of the world. Mm. Uh, that's, that's a plus of having uh, such a central control, but the blockchain, of course, is not centrally controlled. But my point is of having uh, such a large uh, social buy-in mm. to a common purpose, mm. which may make it seem like Big Brother. Mm, uh, exactly. So in, in China now, they have uh, AI and machine learning technology tied in to uh, one of the largest CCTV uh, networks on the planet, yeah. so that wherever yeah. you go, you're you're you are facially recognised. Mm. And uh, it was already China was already way ahead, yeah. where they had their digital currency, yeah. uh, the digital yuan, uh, yuan, uh, basically running off WeChat, off the yes. chat app. Yeah. Yep. And you pay for everything yeah. through WeChat. And even the beggars on the street, when I got, I'd get to the office, the beggars would have phones with WeChat on it and they would ask Crazy. for money into, into WeChat rather than, than fiat. Uh, yeah, it's insane. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, and now they've made the next step because of the, the large-scale facial recognition and machine learning and AI and the algorithms they've got. Uh, in that you don't even need a WeChat. You just go to the counter, you're facially recognised. It recognises who you are. Uh, it first checks your social score to see whether you have high enough a social score um, to deserve buying that particular commodity because those, those commodities are only available to people with a certain social score and above. Wow. Uh, and, yeah, I guess that's taking it to its logical conclusion. I mean... You even meet people and uh, when you date, uh, you date within your social score because that like takes a lot of the guesswork out of the dating game. You're already, okay, this person's got good credit. They haven't done anything or been controversial about the CCCP, the Communist Party. Mm. Um, our, our family history seem to be similar. Uh, and, yeah, so that level of control, again, that's not a blockchain, but my point is uh, that when you have a public buy-in to something that seems intrusive, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it comes down to adoption and uh, 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 the freedom of adoption. Yeah. They've, if, yeah. if a public ledger mm. is freely mm. adopted, uh, because you can put it to, um, to uh, what you call it, 
uh, to a national survey. You can put mm. it to a referendum. Uh, is the country happy with having executive, legislature, judiciary, and a public ledger? And if they buy in, then where's the, there's, where's the big brother? I mean, yeah. they, everyone has agreed with the social contract that we want the efficiency and the transparency that comes along with this particular technology. And uh, whatever minor hiccups there may be, um, we're willing to, to bear them. Uh, I think the, the issue with uh, one of the best illustrations is with uh, cryptocurrency, so that uh, those who believe in traditional currency say uh, cryptocurrencies began as libertarian, uh, wanting to keep away from fiat mm. and uh, giving the individual rights. But at the end of the day, now uh, a small group of institutional buyers and whales are going to buy up uh, all the cryptocurrency. Yep. You move away from uh, the libertarian goal. And one of their concerns is how do you enforce uh, property rights, individual property rights, uh, and the rule of law with respect to property rights? And I think actually one of the best examples of the different paradigm that cryptocurrency has. Mm. In traditional pro public property rights, you know, individual property rights, uh, uh, Western liberal uh, democratic capitalism focuses almost unhealthily on individual property rights. In cultures mm. such as ours, mm. uh, property rights are meant to be about either communal ownership of property rights yep. or personal ownership of property rights under a communal system that is equitably distributed. Mm. So our focus isn't so much on the individual. Mm. It's ensuring that everyone gets a, a fair crack at having those uh, some sort of property rights. Mm. And what cryptocurrencies do is they remove the, the, the hegemony of, of the central uh, banking financial institutions mm. and they take away the reliance on the state for the enforcement of property rights because when you have your own uh, seed phrases, mm. uh, you, you have sovereign complete uh, control over your property rights because only you uh, can uh, use those in, if you're they used responsibly. You have full power. Uh, you have full sovereignty over your, your um, digital assets so that rather than relying on the state, you're the one who has to be responsible to making sure that your digital assets are not left for too long on an exchange because an exchange is connected to the internet and the internet can be hacked. But so that's, the that's funny. your yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So because it's it's, it's Spider-Man. With, mm -hmm. with great power becomes great responsibility. You are yes. given complete power over your, your digital assets. So it's up to you to ensure that it's not... Uh, on the exchange for too long, that it moves to the soft wallet first. Uh, and because you control this, the seed phrase and therefore you are in uh, full uh, sovereign control of your digital assets. But then also, because you're in full uh, sovereign control, that's still connected to the internet. So you want to, to go uh, one layer further, safer. So then you go to cold storage which is air gap from the internet. So you go through levels of exerting your personal sovereignty over your digital asset and being responsible for it. And you yourself enforce your property rights. And that's kind of at the heart of the whole cryptocurrency thing is to give, you give yourself uh, sovereignty, but you also give yourself responsibility. And the sort of um, metamorphosis into the new paradigm of uh, property 
rights being uh, returned to the individual, which every libertarian American should love. They should not complain about that because they're being given, this is like, this is almost like a, a digital currency version of their Second Amendment right. You're not relying on the police to, to look after you. Here's your gun. You have the right to protect your safety. And here are your keys. You have the right to protect your property, your digital property. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's, it's, inter it's interesting, right? Because, uh, as you said, the influence of the libertarians um, from the very early days and the idealism, um, which is right. very, it, it's noble, right? And it makes for a great vision um, for crypto, Bitcoin, et cetera. But I think one thing that I've even noticed, if not, even if it's not completely practical, sometimes. exactly because I was just gonna say, right? There, the problem at, on mass, right? If 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 crypto or Bitcoin or whatever, you know, is to be something that everybody ends up using, um, that right. self responsibility, most people don't have the discipline to be able to protect their things right. because they lose those seed phrases, they lose those passwords, and then right. poof, all gone. Which is already happening. Right. It continues all to happen. Gone. All, yeah, right? Not, not kind of gone. All gone. All gone. There's exactly. No, there's no uh, bank you can sue. Mm -hmm. There's no... Yeah, yeah. Once, once you've gone, then that's it. It's all your fault. And that's <laughs> the, the extreme level of libertarianism. Mm -hmm. that, that, and that it just doesn't meld well with our culture because mm -hmm. our cultures are libertarian cultures. Yep. Our culture... Uh, liberal cultures, yep. we respect the freedom of religion, we respect the freedom of the press, we respect the uh, freedom of association, we respect the freedom, the right of the public to petition the monarch or the, the government. But all those things, uh, we, we still uh, believe in the fact that the state should ensure that our children have free education, free health care. These, these are very Polynesian things because the community, the village, the nation are supposed to assure these things for our citizens. So, yeah, I think libertarianism per, in its purest form, really in any of its forms, does not meld well with our cultures. They, they're almost anathema. They're almost complete opposites. And there are different camps of libertarians as well that you'll find. And there's a reason why, like, libertarianism doesn't event doesn't make its way into uh, I guess uh, popular uh, governance systems right because it is an ideology that can be quite extreme uh, sometimes uh, but you know it's like I'm fan of the ideas of libertarianism um, and I get yeah, it same here. Exactly. like we can learn from it right um, but mm. I think yeah from the cryptocurrency standpoint uh, in many ways you know it's, it's interesting even seeing my own evolution in this space from like 2013 right. um mm -hmm. at the beginning you know when i was much younger right you know i used to be the type that would go you know protest as well in melbourne australia um <laughs> against injustices and whatnot but then you grow up you, you you know you learn you see where power really exists and then you see why things are a certain way um and then sure. i i realized that uh things like crypto still it's it doesn't change human behaviors if anything it's right now it's just providing an anchor for of hope right? Right, right but all of the practical things from the technology side to infrastructure um to things working in the real world that starts to come out right you know it starts to yeah, uh, exactly to show itself when people are trying to use the damn thing or you know they, they actually try to um operate in the real world with these things because yeah. you know we we still have the issue of like most people derive the value of crypto in fiat. So we in have fiat, it, no. it's, exactly. it. So the, even the libertarian it ideas, no it makes no sense. You know, like people are celebrating these same types of people celebrate the, the, the increase in price in fiat, the thing that they say they're trying to get, <laughs> you know, move away from. Yeah. And, and, and that's why for me, yeah. uh, I'll often hear in some of the groups, you know, it's like, oh yeah, you know, like price go up. And then I'm just like, but do you understand what you're actually gotten yourself into? But I understand too that there's power in people feeling like they have a way of out of the system or predicaments, right? Of yeah. creating intergenerational wealth. And uh, that's what I would love to segue into, you know, because I know you have been very active in, in clubhouse groups and uh, mm -hmm. other, other groups where, you know, really 
I, I like the fact that they're about empowering people to, you know, um, get more financially yeah. set, et cetera. So um, what have your, your experiences been, you know, in terms of learning um, from these groups, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. they've been great. Um, <clears throat> as, as with uh, most things, as with most things, uh, what I'm seeking out of any uh, learning situation is something that will benefit my people. You know, I mean, as a traditional leader, every, uh, as they say, you should not, when you're in Bitcoin, you should, uh, you should price everything in terms of Bitcoin. Whatever you see, you shouldn't price it in terms of fiat anymore. Uh, and that's what happens when you become a traditional leader is that you don't, view anything in terms of its impact upon you individually you view it in terms of how can i make use of this to better the lives of my people and uh this particular technology um yeah a quick example uh and any uh other technologies aside who have similar properties uh you can say the same about but 30 percent of tonga is unbanked Mm. So that's because farmers uh, who are, make up a, a large proportion of our, uh, our private sector, uh, government is the largest employer, as with most countries uh, who um, have a large public sector and who are dependent on public sector for a lot of services. Yeah. Uh, and then in the private sector, as has is traditionally the case, it's farming and uh, fishing. Mm. So farming and fishing are cash businesses and banks don't really like cash business um, uh, clients uh, unless they're the small business variety and up. Mm. Uh, so there's 30% unbanked, but there's 99.95% penetration of cell phones, of mm -hmm. smartphones, yes. because digital, digital is planned worldwide. In Ireland, in the Caribbean, where it has a stronghold, uh, it, it, it makes a lot of money in the developing world. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Digicel. It's an yeah, Irish they got company. It. Yeah, they got it here in uh, Panama. Um, so ah, well, they, yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Digicel has... Uh, 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 an ecosystem where you can pay for your groceries on your phone, et cetera, et cetera. So with that 99.95% penetration, because they make their money on uh, credit top-ups and the remittances that people send back from overseas, you can now send directly to a Digicel phone. Um, that makes the, the population... Uh, with that access to cell phones and therefore to a warm wallet, 99.95% banked because you now have access uh, to currencies that hold their value across space and time. Uh, I can get it to you at the other end of the planet within a few minutes. And unlike the, uh, the Western Union, I'm not going to charge you a hundred, two hundred dollars to send a thousand dollars, which is hard for me to say because although I'm a member of parliament, I'm a barrister by trade, and the people who own Western Union are my largest on retainer corporate client, so they're probably not going to be happy with me saying this. But yeah, those prices are just uh, they yeah they're unjustifiable. And the bank's prices are unjustifiable. So getting that currency uh, from San Francisco or from Sydney or from Auckland onto that phone uh, uh, costs a lot less. And so it holds its value across space. And if you're lucky, depending on what time of the day it is, uh, the amount of money that it'll cost to send is fairly low. But also, the amount you receive might actually be more than the amount that was sent because, yeah, because of the, the volatility of crypto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might exactly. actually... Yeah, exactly. So the, that fact 
and the fact that um, for people like ours, uh, I mean, the African Americans are the extreme case, uh, but our people also have been as migrants uh, in host countries have been marginalized from the traditional paths to generational wealth. Uh, our access to real estate uh, hasn't been as bad as the US where African-Americans were by zoning policy, were literally zoned out of areas uh, where they could uh, purchase and own real estate for generations. That would be the foundation of generational wealth and had banking policies which, uh, uh, in, in inverted commas, zoned them out of access to capital from which they could build generational wealth. Uh, it hasn't been that extreme for us, but the, uh, the access of Pacifica to uh, the traditional um, paths and mechanisms of generational wealth uh, aren't, aren't too much better. So to have a technology that um, a factory worker can invest uh, a reasonable amount, an amount that they can afford to lose weekly uh, on a dollar cost average basis into an asset that can form the basis for generational wealth is a completely novel uh, and new phenomenon um, in the history of our peoples, and particularly in the history of our peoples, which is quite recent, in the history of our peoples in Western capitalist uh, societies. That's that's a phenomenon that's less than oh, 70, 80 years old. Uh, so within that one or two generations, of that uh, 70 or 80 years, uh, our access to tools and mechanisms which could give our diaspora uh, generational wealth. Mm. And therefore, because our GDP in Tonga is made up 54% by remittances from our diaspora, mm. that might <laughs> indirectly gives uh, the recipient of that uh, generational wealth the chance at it also, admittedly within a different uh, paradigm and framework in Tonga, because uh, real estate is, is, is not uh, alienable, mm. which means in legal parlance, it, you can't be sold, bought and sold. Uh, you get land by succession or by nothing else. You get it by legal succession uh, through the, our traditional uh, uh, succession system, which is very meticulously uh, laid out in our land act, which says, so if A dies, it goes to B. If there's no such person as B, it'll go to C. If mm. there's no C, then it'll go to D, E or F's uh, sons first, then daughters. It's, it's a very specific uh, succession system. And that's the only way you come into uh, what's legally called a real interest in land, which means it's a land, it's an interest uh, that can't be um, taken away uh, by any legal, uh, any le illegal means. Mm. Um, so it's, this is speaking more for, for our diaspora. Yep. Uh, yeah, our diaspora's ability to get real estate and generational wealth, mm. uh, the best chance of that has come with this technology. Exactly. Uh, because, and that's why Tongans, uh, hopeless at uh, keeping up with rent payments or mortgage payments mm. when they're overseas because they're born thinking that all land is meant to be free. When mm. I get to Auckland or Sydney or San Francisco, someone's just supposed to come and give me land and a <laughs> <laughs> The entitlement's a little bit of entitlement, huh? <laughs> yeah, very much entitlement. Interesting. Um, yeah. Hmm. So, um, yeah, that's... Those are probably the two main uh, reasons. The fact that it, it gives us um, access, the on-island people access to more uh, options in the diaspora remittances or 
the ways that it can be remitted and the format or currencies which can be remitted that hold wealth in different ways and are costed out in different ways in fee structures and the generational wealth aspect uh, giving us the tools to those. Those are the two major, major things uh, that have drawn me, uh, as you've said, to spending yeah, nigh on 24 hours a day on those, in those rooms. <laughs> I think whenever you come into one, I'm already yeah. there. <laughs> Seriously, man, you are like, you are a beast with those rooms, man. I don't know how you do it because that's a lot of listening. But I, I know that uh, sort of everybody learns and engages differently too. For me, um, I think if I have to listen to something for too long, like I just zone out. Whereas I know some people love being on a phone, you know, or love, you know, listening into things. Right. Um, and actually, yeah, many of our, uh, uh, I guess, listeners for the podcast, you know, they're the ones who enjoy, right, that sort of medium. Yeah. Um, well, it's ideal for me. I mean, I'm two things. I'm by trade and vocation, mm -hmm. a barrister, a lawyer, yeah. and career now, a politician. And pretty much all we do is listen and mm. listen and talk a lot. Yep. <laughs> and, I, and I know it is the Polynesian way too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's so Tala Polynesian, no. right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that so fits in with uh, our Polynesian way. Oh, yeah. man. So that's true. true my, like, yeah, my mom, uh, she, she uh, whenever she did in, um, have, uh, you know, like a, a relative over, a family member or something, you know, it's so... Right common for her to just be up all night um you know talking with yeah. them until the early morning yeah. about what i don't you come know. out and get ready to work and they're like uh, going. can you make us sandwiches and 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 it will give please yeah yeah straight oh, away oh man it is yeah definitely um something about our peoples that uh is common um but you know and that's, I, that's, I mean, we had to be because yeah. our histories weren't written down Oral. It's those constant conversations and that constant retelling, retelling of that story over again that mm. has it, uh, yeah, burned into your psyche to, to be handed down to the next generation. Uh, and, yeah, I, th I think it's a great asset for us to have mm. in that we're a people that can, can literally just talk about our history to one another and, uh, and uh, have it downloaded and ready for the next generation just by constantly having a good chat exactly and there's so many side benefits and we'll probably have to save this for another discussion between you and i but you know oral storytelling yeah. well, this, 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 this is going to be the first of many bro. exactly <laughs> um but oral storytelling right there's so many things that are linked to a memory one thing i can appreciate you know going back to my families or other indigenous groups around the world right because of their ability to, uh, to remember all of these stories that were passed down to them, right? They have very good memory. But in our modern times, we've outsourced or delegated most of our knowledge to technology. Exactly. You know? And, and exactly. The, and it's sad because the, so the attention ability, spans are short. Our attention span, our ability to hold an extended uh, amount of information mm -hmm. or extend uh, time, time, uh, chunk of audio or video memory uh, has con has contracted just like any muscle yes the less it's you it withers away and it has there's no two ways about it that mm. generationally the the newest generation has it the most acutely an inability to hold um, uh, particularly analytical thought so mm. it's very hard for them to see through an analytical argument from beginning to end, if it, if it means going across paragraphs and paragraphs and pages and pages of following a logical argument to its conclusion. Yeah. I found that skill has begun to ebb away. Yeah, that's definitely a thing. 100%. Um, I think maybe uh, a couple final questions because I know you and I can uh, talk <laughs> for a long time. Yeah, we can but talk for this session. <laughs> You know, you know, I got so many other questions. Um, uh, but I, I think, know, right? like I maybe, said, this is the first many, first so we're going to get to all. Exactly. Um, so maybe the last couple ones. Um, uh, how do you see, uh, I guess, Tonga's uptake of uh, maybe let's focus on the government, right? 
of like these emerging yep. tools and technologies? Uh, what is the right. current state yeah, of the government? Great. That's a great question. So two years ago, uh, the government at the time, there's a gentleman by the name of Akilisi Pohiva, who was prime minister, and he had certain changes he was trying to push through. Um, one of the vestigial, uh, in 2010, so uh, George V was the first monarch since Charles I of England 500 years ago. And actually, Charles I did it under duress. They were going to kill him. So that's not really uh, applicable. You have to go back to ancient Rome to find a monarch who had absolute power who just woke up one day and went, rightio, um, we're going to have a democracy tomorrow and I'm going to give all my power away <laughs> without any bloodshed. Uh, and that's basically what he did in 2010. So he said to the government, uh, draft up the laws, the laws necessary, the amendments of the constitution for me to divest myself of all my executive authority and to become a monarch like the English, the British monarch and to be ceremonial. And uh, the country will then be run uh, by the elected members of parliament. And at the time, uh, it was nine people's reps and nine lords reps, an equal number, and then a cabinet chosen by his majesty from technocrats. So the, our old cabinets used to be the king would just go, who's the best Tongan doctor in the world? All right, he's in San Francisco, find him. He's going to be the minister of health. Who's the best Tongan lawyer in the world? So he'd just find the best Tongans in each field and appeal to their sense of duty if they weren't in Tonga. Many were overseas because uh, they had more lucrative careers and he'd appeal to their sense of duty and everyone to a man and to a woman said, uh, absolutely, we serve at your majesty's pleasure. They gave up uh, our minister of health, William Tangi, who's a... Uh, one of the heads, uh, fellows of the uh, Royal Australian uh, uh, Association of uh, Surgeons, gave up a half a million dollar a, a year career to come back and earn 30000 a year as our Minister of Health. So when the, well, the fifth, George V gave up those powers, he increased the number of people in Parliament to 17, kept the nobles at nine, which meant that the people would always have a majority. But if they, if they could uh, um, find a consensus amongst them, they could form a government. For 17 and 9 is 26, which means 14 is a majority. So you'll need 14 uh, to form a government. So if you can find 14 uh, uh, people's reps who are in agreement, uh, on policy and everything, they could form a government without the Lords. Uh, what it has shown, and what I'm assuming George V knew, was that we could not, you'll never find 14 <laughs> that agree with each other. Because we don't have political parties, everyone's an independent. So everyone's out for themselves. Wow. Uh, wow. On the one hand, that means that each constituency is represented properly because the MP's loyalty is to his constituency, not to a political party. It's to his village. So he'll make sure his village uh, comes first and then his political aspirations or beliefs second. But that also means that uh, it, it's not easy to find... Um, it takes a bit of horse trading to build a, four, a group of 14, which meant... And I, I guess that's what George V intended, was that you'd need to uh, come and have a government of national unity by including some of the lords, uh, because the lords play a very... The lords are like senators. They play... A, because the reason our numbers weren't increased is because we, we, we were kept to the old regional representation. We have three lords for Tongatapu, two lords for Hapai, two lords for Vava'u, one for Niwa and one for Ewa, so that each uh, region is represented. So it's like a senator. Um, so that meant that now uh, His Majesty held 
what we call the vestigial vestigial powers or the uh, his um, his inherent powers as monarch, and they are uh, they became even more important. Uh, he appoints the attorney general, the police commissioner, the supreme court judges, and the anti corruption commissioner. And the reason that was kept was once politicians run the country, then these officers, which must necessarily be apolitical, you can't have these guys being political appointments because that means the prime minister will just appoint the attorney general that will never investigate him. Or he will appoint the anti-corruption commissioner that will never investigate him. So we needed to make those appointments non-political and the only non-political body left in the constitution is the king because mm. he's no yeah. longer in politics yep. and yep. by law he can't be uh, charged criminally or sued civilly under the constitution so he really doesn't care who's in these positions as long as they're qualified they're neutral and they're not political they get the job and what this prime minister had tried mm. He was trying to sever His Majesty's uh, role and give those roles to the Prime Minister and Cabinet so that the Prime Minister and Cabinet would effectively have full control of the country. They would run, then the executive would run the executive and the judiciary and the legislature, which there's no separation of powers then. Mm, damn. Wow, it's a, it's a really interesting setup, yeah, that you guys have. And you know, yeah. it, it reminds me actually when I was uh, studying about uh, how the U.S. Constitution came to be and how, you know, they took things um, from, you know, a Native American group, uh, it, right. right? And it wasn't, it wasn't the, I forgot which particular clan um, or, or group it was, but one thing that I found very fascinating was the U.S. Um, and those original um, leaders they, they took what they wanted, but they actually left out a very important piece of the puzzle. And that was the role of the clan mother, or essentially uh, right. people with integrity that actually are part of the choosing of a leader. That's it. Right? And, and you can right. see how that is played out in the West as well, yeah. and why corruption it's, comes it's, in. It's so important that the person who chooses the leader has integrity and ethics Yes. And isn't part yep. of that political system where you have to play dirty to get in, to get into into uh, into Congress or into the Senate. Exactly. Yeah, they have to be clear of that process. So true. Yeah. And, and and this is a thing I think that like I guess uh, our type of cultures right have to share is that you know the sort of the negligence around integrity in choosing which, you know, for yeah. like some of these, you know, Native American cultures where, uh, yeah, the role of the clan mother, right? Like they also, and, and it's, it's similar to what you're sharing about the, in Tongan uh, society as well, right? The role of the man and the woman, right? Uh, the, 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 the sisters, the females, they'll have actually higher social rank. And I think for these clans, it was similar. They were the ones, I think they said, the man is the one who sits in the chair, um, but it's like the woman is the one who, um, who chooses the chair or, or something of the sort. Right. You, you, right. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, That's very, very close to us. And, and, and that integrity part keeps coming back. Um, but I think uh, on that note, um, <laughs> we might leave it and maybe I might just get you to, uh, you know, if there's one piece of advice, right, that you'd give to anybody listening right. uh, when it mm -hmm. comes to, uh, you know, let's say, uh, the, the Pacific away or the, the Tongan culture, uh, let's say for anyone from the West, you know, coming in to operate in the Pacific, you know, what's one piece right. of advice you'd give to them uh, if they were looking to, you know, do business, get involved with the people or even learn right. something? Uh, I think my one piece of advice, um, as most uh, people who advise foreigners coming into the Pacific is uh, the generic, uh, nothing, nothing wrong with it. It's very correct. I respect the culture when you go in, respect their practices. Uh, but that's a more general statement. Uh, my advice would be 
to respect that very specific part of reciprocity. Always remember that everything is two ways. So uh, Tongan culture is very much about, I make sure that you won't lose face. So if you promised your colleagues abroad that you would get this deal done, uh, even if I don't think it should go through, I will do it in such a way that you do not lose face and that perhaps you have other options. I might even suggest other solutions for, for uh, the jo joint venture, whatever it is that you're seeking. Um, and uh, I mean, I mean, the, the threshold one would obviously be, uh, yeah, let's, let's go into business. Come, uh, we can do it. Um, and just ensure that it's a, it's a reciprocal uh, relationship. Uh, you respect um, what is culturally important to me enough uh, to make provision for it in whatever your project is. And I respect the fact that you may have uh, shareholders or a board to report to. So I have to make sure that uh, I don't uh, cover up anything using culture as an excuse. I make sure that we are as transparent with you as you need us to be. So yeah, when things in Tongan, we call it uh, which means uh, put yourself in the other person's shoes and see what what they'd want out of this situation and don't just look for what you want out of this situation, but try and make uh, allowance so that you can both, uh, ultimately, the best solution is always a win-win solution. Yep, exactly. The win-win. Um, perfect advice uh, for us to close this session on. Uh, thank you, brother. Seriously, thank you so much for your time, you know, straight from the hospital. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, there's, as I said to you, there's nothing, uh, uh, no hiccup that would be too great uh, to keep me from having this chat with you. And as I said, the first of many, exactly. um, I will, I'll, I'm completely available uh, my time uh, because I have so much respect and I'm so inspired by the work that you are doing uh, and doing for the right reasons. And yeah, man. I, don't get me started. I'm going to go on about it forever. <laughs> How much I love what you're doing. Oh, so, likewise. yeah. The respect's mutual. I appreciate mind. you, brother. I appreciate you very much. And I'm sure after this, we're each going to grab a quick meal and then yep. we're both going to be in, in one of the rooms for hours <laughs> <laughs> with another group of people. Exactly. But, yeah, thank you, my brother. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, bro.